thank you to everyone from the Academy for inviting me here today and making this great event possible. It's, it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, yesterday, I spoke about resiliency, because I'm also the Energy Assurance Coordinator for the Wisconsin Office of Energy Innovation. And for those of you who don't know, it's the state uh, federally designated energy office for this state. So in the 1970s, as a response to the oil crisis, the feds thought we should have energy offices who are monitoring petroleum supplies and helping us think about other ways to get off of foreign oil and pathways to energy independence. So we've taken that and we've run with it with uh, the help of our good friends from the U.S. Department of Energy and their funding. So today I'm going to be very brief because we've got two excellent speakers who are uh, one, Ned Noel from City of Eau Claire is going to talk to you about their newly minted goals, and I think we've heard a little bit about that. And then Manus McDevitt is going to talk to us about Madison's impressive goals. I'll go over our Energy Independent Communities program that the Energy Office has been sponsoring since uh, 2008, why these goals matter, and uh, a little bit about how we can help. So first of all, Energy Independent Communities, it was a program that started in 2008 under the Doyle administration. It was a huge push. He had cabinet secretaries having competitions across the state to recruit communities. We've got about 147 communities, including cities, towns, villages, school districts. Um, and the state at that time encouraged a 25 by 25 goal. Replace 25% of your current energy use with renewables. Do the energy efficiency, but get to the renewables. Um, after 2010, that push from the top was not as prescriptive. So um, that's when I joined the energy office, and I was lucky to work with my colleague Sherry Gruder at UW Extension, where we got to do meetings all over the state from 2011. We planned them in 2011, 2012 through 2015. We got out in every corner of the state, and we talked to communities, and we said, what do you think about this energy independent community program? What goals do you want to set? And, and we heard from communities that they, they love it, and they want to set even more aggressive goals. And so we set about trying to find ways to help them. So why do goals matter? I mean, goals matter because great projects happen when there's comprehensive planning and thoughtful goal setting. So since 2013, the Energy Office, which is funded with about $800,000 of federal money every year, we've put out more than $3 million in grants to communities for planning and implementation. And we're going to keep putting money out there because that's, that's what we need to get the right groups of people together to make the solar gardens happen, to make the energy efficiency happen, to make the transportation energy efficiency happen. So we also like to leverage our state's incredible ratepayer-funded energy efficiency program, Focus on Energy. 15 years old, it's robust, it's fabulous. If you don't know your Focus on Energy representative, you should. It's your money. 1.2% uh, of all retail sales are paid into the Focus on Energy pot of money, and then they're meted out through great programs. This is just our 2017 Focus on Energy Renewable Energy com Competitive Incentive Program results. But you can see there are investments being made in these areas, and, um, and I applaud you all for going out there and getting this money. Bring it back to your communities and use it in a sustainable way. Other resources we have. The Energy Office created a, the Municipal Energy Efficiency and Technical Assistance Program. Because uh, we found from these meetings we had around the state, the, the big barrier is money. But another barrier is technical assistance to make sure that the projects are good. We provide an independent third-party analysis. Typically, it's getting that energy use baseline right, getting that weather correction done properly. Understand your utility usage, triple down on the energy efficiency, and then you're, you're ready for renewables then you're ready for that 100% sustainability. So contact me, contact the Energy Office, we can help you out with um, free services. But there's something a little more exciting I have to talk about today. In 2009, the Energy Office was awarded $55 million through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. We took about 25 million of that right off the bat and we gave some grants to some large manufacturers to keep them in the state. The rest of it was turned into a revolving clean energy manufacturing loan fund. We didn't have a lot of uptake in that loan fund in the last three or four years. And so after our move to the Public Service Commission, it was decided by the commissioners just two weeks ago that this loan fund should be turned to grants. The Department of Energy agreed that it could be grants and that we could open up the eligibility from just manufacturers to include municipal entities. I think this is exciting. So we'll have $5 million on the street in the next couple of weeks. The order is coming from the PSC, but the commissioners have voted, and it is public record, that $5 million will be put out there. Manufacturers of all size will also be eligible to apply under two broad categories, planning and implementation. 
for implementation, building energy efficiency projects, renewable energy. The commissioner specifically called out energy storage and resiliency. Transportation and transportation infrastructure will also be eligible, as those are categories that we typically can't work through the Focus on Energy program because focus is about electric and gas utilities. So the RFP is coming out soon. I don't have all the details, but please watch for it. Um, these slides will be available to you. Since we are at the Public Service Commission, we have all the great electronic resources that the PSC uses, like the IRF system. You can subscribe to the docket. You can see when there are updates. Um, it's, it's really fabulous, and it's very modern. So I encourage you to get these links um, and follow this process, because when that RFP comes out, it will have all the information, the grading rubric, and it's a great way to get interesting projects done, microgrids, resilient communities. Um, let's think big. We'll have five years, $5 million a year if everything goes well. So without further ado, then, I'd like to turn it over to the real stars of the show. We'll start with Ned Knoll. He's an associate planner for the city of Eau Claire, practiced urban planning for over 13 years within the Twin Cities and Eau Claire markets. And in his role, he also helps the city coordinate efforts on sustainability and healthy community design. Please welcome Ned. Maybe you can cue me up, but yeah. uh, pleasure to be uh, with you all and just thank you for the Academy to uh, decide to come to Eau Claire to host this wonderful event that we can convene and talk about these issues that matter to us locally, statewide and nationally and globally. And so I'm just going to share, I was asked to share about Eau Claire's experience, kind of our, our journey and it, and it continues to be a journey uh, to maybe enlighten some of you, whether you're elected officials or staffers with your own local communities um, or just policy people in general. So uh, with my role with the city, I'm a city planner, so I look at the systems that build the city and make sure that they're functioning well and growing. Um, and so uh, probably I've been with the city now about 11 years, and so I've seen where, where we've come from in terms of uh, these initiatives with energy and climate change goals. and. Uh, it's nice when you have been around for a while to be able to see that progress and also inform new, newly elected officials to it from a staff point of view that uh, where we've been and where we're going. Um, so from that point of view, um, it's helpful as a staff person to have that continuity to be able to uh, talk about the past and then also um, help people to understand where we may be going. So just from the local point of view, Eau Claire, um, where we're at, uh, just, just with this helpful resource here, the, the maps that show the, the temperature changes, you know, this is a local issue across the whole state, various places, you know, it's gonna be a little bit more temperature change, but for us over the 50 years or so from 1960s, about three, three degrees of warming, and then what's predicted by 2050, which as you heard from our council president, this 2050 is really our, our goal date, uh, we're expected to warm another three degrees, so six degrees of warming does impact um, the systems that we have, whether they're natural or built environment. And so, um, you know, I think this is, you know, let's, let's just be real here. This isn't really a political issue. This is a factual issue when it comes down to what, what is causing that, glow, that warming. And so, you know, just a, a graph here from the EPA talking about uh, looking at the different forcings of, uh, of the warming. And you can see the acceleration over the last 50 years or so about uh, why, why our uh, lo local areas are warming. Uh, this shows that those, primarily the burning of fossil fuels are increasing the heat trapping um, of our solar radiation to warm our planet, whether it's our oceans, or our land, or our atmosphere. And so this is a, a matter that's really important uh, for our elected officials. Um, and, you know, as, again, as a city planner, I look at these systems that we have built, whether they're bridges or roads or our homes, um, and so with the, the warming and the freezing in the thaw, I mean, just basic things that a lot of the local government uh, uh, electeds deal with the pothole issues that we have, especially around this time of the year. And so we've had a lot of that. And, and that's uh, when you've got the freeze-thaw cycle. You know, that's always something of a nuisance. And just, um, you know, we, we've seen devastating hurricanes that there's, when there's more energy because of heat into the atmosphere, that's going to power these extreme storms, whether they're rain events or hurricanes, and that these affect livelihoods and, and washouts with higher rain events. And just from a point of view of uh, having to redo some of our infrastructure, whether it's the bridges 
around uh, vulnerable areas with coastal flooding. You know, these are major expenses, whether it's uh, planning in, in the beginning for it or um, dealing with it after a, a horrible uh, natural event like a hurricane. So th these, are, these are reasons why uh, the city of Eau Claire is motivated to uh, do something about this issue. And back in uh, June, they asked staff to, in our sustainability committee to come up with uh, a response after the president uh, decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Our local officials felt like, well, that is something that uh, they can't stand for, and they directed staff and our sustainability committee to uh, look into this issue about how the city of Eau Claire could actually align with the Paris Agreement. And if you know about the Paris Agreement, it's really for nations, not for local governments. And so we kind of struggled with trying to understand how a local footprint could actually align with a national type um, strategy. And it is possible. And so basically, uh, we, we looked at our own carbon footprint and came up with strategies. And this is an uh, example here of uh, our president had mentioned that really the municipality's carbon footprint is about 2.5% of the whole uh, total emissions. And the university is included in the, in the gray silo there too. And so we, our elected officials realized that you know, we, we have a, a role to play as a leader and also for, as an organizational point of view. But the bigger issue is our community and how are we going to actually advance these things when it comes to the community. And so I think one of the things is to translate this to kind of dumb down the, the, the uh, emissions was to help them to understand. This is a helpful calculator on EPA's website to look at, well, what does this translate? All of these metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, what does this really look like? And so for Eau Claire, at least, it would be about a quarter of a, a power plant, a coal power plant. And so that helped them to realize, wow, that's, that's a chunk of um, you know, coal emissions it could be looking at from that point of view, or from renewables, you know, what would that look like to power the whole city on renewables, a very large uh, wind farm in this case, and then also how to, how to actually get at carbon uh, neutral and plant that many acres of forest to be able to uh, carbon sink all of those emissions. And so this kind of helped to put it in perspective that it is a big Eau Claire, even though we're a small city, uh, it is, it, there are a lot of emissions that are still um, occurring. And so one of the things that we felt, and this is, a, um, I think, an important strategy if you're looking to get into this work, is to gauge the, the citizen response in your community. And so um, as the chancellor had mentioned, we partnered with the university. I always hire somebody from the university here as my sustainability intern. And in this case, uh, she was able to do her capstone research project on a community uh, sustainability development survey. And so we gauged the, uh, the community about what they think and feel about this issue. Is it important to them to help inform the local officials? And so it just wasn't their own agendas. It was, well, what, what do the people think? And so we can see in these graphs that 75% you know, more strongly agreed or agreed about what we should do, not only in the city level, but the community level when it comes to capturing the, and reducing the carbon dioxide. Also, too, uh, this was... We ran this by um, our, our utility partner, uh, in this case, Excel Energy, to, to really look at kind of you know, where, where this comes down to oftentimes is that, you know, are you willing to pay a little bit more to be able to make those changes? And by and large, the community uh, also supported, you know, I mean, this is kind of extreme with the $200. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal that whoever that's, you know, those people were. But, you know, roughly around $16 or so that they would be willing to pay more on their on their monthly bill. And so to translate that, you know, if like they would choose to have wind source as an um, option for them on their utility bills, you know, it really wouldn't be a whole lot over the whole course of a year, maybe $200. And so that helped, I think, the public to realize that, you know, these major changes not necessarily cost big dollars. And so um, this was a question that was actually um, brought to us by Excel is, you know, why not also engage about willingness to pay? And so I think it was a, a very good insight. Also, we asked the people, our utility uh, providers are, are providing very uh, renewable energy already and carbon-free energy, uh, and they continue want to do more of that, but what does the community think? Should we be even more aggressive? And in this case, again, about 75% of the folks felt like, yeah, we should do some more. And so, you know, we're proud to say that we're offering that uh, really through Excel Energy's program. 
with the community solar is that you know the community can take part of if they want more renewable energy today at the community solar garden across from Excel's headquarter, uh, head, headquarters over at this landfill that the city owns. And so those options are avail already available uh, for homeowners, for business owners, and many have taken part in that. So to boil all this down for our policymakers, our sustainability committee and staff, we looked at you know, uh, these goals. And so if our goal is 2050, to reach 100% uh, renewable energy and carbon neutrality by then, how can we look at that in the interim steps? And so we, we boiled it down to these decade uh, uh, drops. So um, if you look at the top one, 4% annually, that's where we're thinking about with technology advances in price it, um, declines on some of these technologies, we'll be able to do more. And so each decade, you know, we get more aggressive but in the more near term, we're looking at smaller um, steps, 1% annually, to get to um, the 5% drop by 2020. And so what we're using here is a baseline of 2015. And the reason why we chose 2015 is that the, that's the first year that we were able to uh, get energy data for the whole uh, community. And it's been mentioned that um, in our case, Excel Energy has these community energy reports. And so we can... It's um, de-identified um, information from utility bills, but we can understand all of the natural gas and electricity uses uh, within the city. And so based off of that reliable data, this was the first time we were able to look at the carbon footprint, the energy footprint of our whole community. And so that's why we chose to do 2015. And so now we're moving into this fall. We're, we're trying to plan and gear up and try to... Um, Due, uh, due diligence to a process that would serve our community well uh, related to a climate and energy action plan. And so we kind of call this the retirement plan for fossil fuels. You know, how, how do we get there? Incremental in, uh, investments over time. And so every, I think our council really understood that, you know, we have to be realistic about this transition, that there's different uh, diverse um, fuel types that serve uh, affordable energy, reliable energy, um, there's clean energy, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so we have to look at a planning a process that does justice to the, the, the current realities but moves the needle forward. And so uh, this process is going to look at that, working with our utilities and also um, the groups that uh, for, uh, the more, more um, marginal audiences, whether it's low income. And so looking at, um, you know, first of all, energy efficiency is and conservation is number one that you need to focus on before you even look at energy uh, renewables. And so making sure that we're doing due diligence for that, not only for the, the city, but also the community. Just installation alone can save you big money when it comes to uh, the bills, whether it's um, your, your home or your business. And then incrementally investing more in the renewables and then electrifying more vehicles and growing these carbon sinks, whether it's our tree, urban tree canopy or tree preservation when it comes to developments. So the, uh, the keys to success that I have found, just as a person who's been around 10 years or so uh, with this whole process, is that the policies that were in place in the past with our comprehensive plan, our sustainability chapter, really set the foundation to be able to advance to these levels. And then also with the Office of Energy Independence, or the Innovation, excuse me, um, that 25% goal by 2025 20, really set us on this whole trajectory in the first place, to first measure uh, what we use, to have a goal in the first place, and then now to be able to actually take that goal further, where we have met um, the electricity portion of the 25%. So that was really key. And then really all of these partners, we, we can't do this alone, whether it's just the city. Uh, we really need to work with the community. And again, we, we gauge the community's voice and we know that they, they support the utilities leadership. Both of our utilities are fantastic in terms of their commitment to uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. And so being with a uh, strong partnership with them, the elected leadership setting those goals as policy and then executive leadership. We've had three city managers since I've been around, and all three have been very supportive, encouraging staff to do their part to help inform uh, the elected officials to make the decisions. And then finally, um, just staff, that they're engaged and, and knowledgeable, providing that, that objective information so that the, uh, the policymakers can make their decisions. 
And so is this all possible? I think, you know, it, it's going to be definitely a journey. It's um, intimidating in some ways, but also uh, in many ways we can do this. And I think, you know, the answers are just around the corner when you, when you think about, you know, dad trying to figure out smart guy in the garage, you know, coming up with, you know, a, a zero emissions vehicle. And here the kids are with a bicycle and, and they don't, you know, dad doesn't even realize it. So the answers are there. And I, and I look forward to working with um, our community together to, to figure out this plan, but also collectively too, whether it's in our uh, region with our communities or just statewide too. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here, to be with you and to uh, really focus on these issues and that, that matter to our local communities. So thank you. Thank you, Ned, that was great. Um, we're gonna move on. I should have mentioned both of these presenters are from energy independent communities. And the, uh, you know, Ned said the Office of Energy Independence, we've changed the name a couple times. And by we, I mean the governor. So you just have to roll that we were the, uh, on your notepads, we're the State Energy Office. Prior to that, we were the Office of Energy Independence. Now we're the Office of Energy Innovation. So. Without further ado, I'll bring up Manus McDevitt. He's a founding principal of Sustainable Engineering Group, LLC, where he has over 25 years of experience in building design, energy engineering, and commissioning. Manus and his firm are currently working with the city of Madison in the development of an action plan to achieve the city's goal of 100% renewable energy and net zero carbon emissions. So, so that was very impressive. Thanks, thanks, Ned. It was a very interesting presentation on the city of Eau Claire. There's gonna be a lot of parallels for what we're doing with the city of Madison. So a little bit of history. Um, so last March uh, 2017, the, uh, the city of Madison uh, unanimously, the council passed a resolution uh, for, for Madison to be uh, a net zero uh, carbon emissions uh, city and also 100% renewable energy. So uh, it, was a, it was a very short discussion um, and everybody was totally behind it. And uh, so that was very exciting. And one of, the, one of the, the, the things that came out of it was uh, they also allocated uh, resources uh, to hire a consultant to, to figure out how to achieve that, that goal of, uh, of net zero carbon emissions. And, uh, they, um, and uh, our firm, Sustainable Engineering Group, along with our partner, uh, Navigant, uh, and Josh is here, I see at the back, um, uh, we were hired to, to be that consultant to develop that action plan. So we're about two-thirds of the way through it, and, and I want to give you a little overview of, of, uh, of where we're at and, um, and some, of the, some of the interesting, exciting things that, that, we're, uh, that we have uh, uncovered. So a more, I guess a more nuts and bolts um, uh, approach uh, um, or overview. And, and, uh, you know, it just wasn't 2017 March where, where they, uh, the council suddenly decide, oh, we want to be uh, sustainable uh, so, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, get really into renewable energy. There was a long history in Madison, and, um, uh, and especially with the Sustainable Madison Committee, a very active committee, and uh, a past uh, chair, uh, Sherry, is here today, and uh, she has a big reason why uh, Madison is where they're at today. So uh, definitely have to acknowledge uh, Sherry's effort there. Um, so, uh, so the first thing that we were challenged to do by the city was assemble stakeholders. So there's a lot of interested people. Uh, Madison is a very, uh, I guess, progressive city, um, and there's a lot of people that have a lot to say um, about different things. <laughs> and so we, we tried as much as possible to gather all their opinions, and so we reached out to as many groups as that we could think of, uh, Nature Conservancy, Clean Wisconsin, Several other ones I, I, I can't remember right now, but the Public Service Commission, uh, the utilities, we, we really have, have uh, formed a really strong bond with our utilities, Madison Gas and Electric and uh, Alliant Energy. And of course, the Sustainable Madison Committee com uh, remains, to be, uh, remains a very um, uh, uh, strong uh, part of, of, our, uh, of our effort. And, and of course, members of the public, you know, general members of the public. So what we did is we, we, we set up a series of three public meetings. And the, the first one uh, was held back in September uh, of last year. 
And uh, we, uh, we had a lot more people attend than we thought. Uh, there was a standing room only, almost 100 people attended. Uh, it collected a lot of comments. Um, it went on for a lot longer than we thought, but that was good. And we also had a guest speaker, Bob Lindmeyer. He's our chief meteorologist uh, with uh, Channel 27. Uh, he came in and gave us a talk and uh, was very passionate about uh, sustainability and that we really need to take action now because he's seeing it in his world. He's seeing the effects of climate change are, are, are incredibly stark and we got to do something. So he was, that was a really good help there. And of course, the media was super interested. Uh, we got a feature on the local television, the, the Wisconsin State Journal, our local paper, and, uh, and the City Channel and the Badger Herald as well. We also have uh, a website, um, and it's an active website, and uh, you know, feel free to go and, and, and look at, at the website, but there's all the material that we've gathered and, and that we've processed to date is on that website. Uh, and also, when we have our public meetings, we have a, a you can see up, up at the top right, submit uh, public comments. So that's where we allow the, the public to, to, to submit their thoughts and, uh, and feedback, and uh, we get some really interesting ideas uh, from the public. But, so the first thing that we, that we, do, that we did, uh, once we started to get into the nuts and bolts, so we gathered all the, the public uh, input. So now we're looking at, well, let's do a baseline of where we're at. How much carbon do we use? And then what sort of baseline will we use moving forward? in order to, uh, to see the effects of any, any, uh, any changes that we make. Well, we're very, very lucky uh, that there's a group called ICLE. Uh, has anybody heard of ICLE? Yep, got a lot of nods. So ICLE is, is a wonderful organization, um, uh, and I'm gonna mess this up, but it's the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives or something like that. Um, but, uh, but they were set up in 1990, and they currently have 84 countries, so it's an international organization, and they do a wonderful job of creating that baseline uh, for carbon. So, because not all carbon is, 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 is the same, not all carbon is equal. So they do a really nice job uh, to help local governments like us uh, uh, track carbon and, and then uh, uh, measure the progress uh, into the future. So, so they, we formed three, three groups uh, of emissions. Of course, the city buildings on the left, uh, the, the vehicle fleets, and another the miscellaneous group. So here's, here's a quick breakdown. And what's really interesting is you see that our biggest portion, our biggest uh, uh, amount of carbon is, is, are from buildings. Um, and then the, the next is the, the fleet. That's, you know, the, the, I guess I should uh, back, back up. This is for the city operations. That's right. And I, miss a, another, I mentioned another little point. Part of our, our, our uh, scope is to deal with looking at how to be net zero carbon for city operations and for the greater community. Uh, and I apologize, I missed that a little bit. So, so the, the first phase was to look at the city operations. So looking at the city operations, uh, we, you know, we discovered majority of, of the emissions are from the buildings. Uh, and then the next uh, is from the, the buses and from the, 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 the fleet that's in the, um, that's that, uh, operated by City of Madison. And what about type of emissions? Well, electricity is by far our biggest uh, uh, producer of carbon. Two thirds of our, of our electricity is generated from coal fired power plants. So that's really a, car a carbon emissions breakdown and, and we use the, the ICLEES database. So uh, this, this, this graph basically summarizes the magnitude of where we need to go and the amount of effort that we need to put in to, to getting to net zero carbon. And you can see, sure, we can, get, we can get some out of building energy efficiency. Yeah, we can get some out of transportation, but we really need to work hard on renewable energy. That's where it's gonna be the biggest amount of effort. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the, the ideas that we're exploring now and that we're, that we're pursuing. But, but you can sort of see renewable energy is going to be the biggest, uh, the biggest factor uh, in reaching net zero carbon. Um, so so let's, look at, let's look at renewable energy. So what are we doing? What ideas are we, are we exploring? Well, it, it, they fall into three categories. Um, 
And there's a lot more detail to this. I'm, this is just an overview. And if there's any specific questions, you'll be happy to answer afterwards. But, but just as an overview, uh, we split the, the renewable energy side to behind the meter solar. That's where on, on buildings, uh, the electron of energy that's produced at the building um, stays at the building. It doesn't go through the meter and back to the grid. It just stays at the building. Um, and then off-site solar or wind, that's where you know, somewhere else, like the community solar garden or, or working with the uh, power purchase uh, uh, agreement, on a power purchase agreement with a third party firm to build a solar farm or a wind farm or something like that. And uh, we basically, the city pays for that. Um, uh, or the, the or, or it's similar to what Ned was saying about the, the city of Eau Claire and the, and the, and the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the large community garden. Uh, uh, project and then renewable energy credits. So, and I'm going to skip along here. It's got five minutes. Uh, so, and then building energy efficiency strategies. Uh, the first one, um, uh, uh, Sherry and, and I worked on together. It's uh, benchmarking. Uh, what an interesting effort. You know, we're, we're so close, <laughs> but but uh, um, but we got uh, the power of lobbyists, I guess. You know, they, they were very strong against benchmarking, but we we're very close. Uh, but you got to measure building performance. Uh, and then retro commissioning, high retro, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, repeating what, uh, what Ned says. But, um, so that's on the building energy efficiency. And then transportation, basically that's a lot simpler. Electrification of our fleet, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and alternative transportation strategies. This is a sort of a summary of, uh, of some of the, the, the end products that we're looking at right now, but, but we, we've been challenged by the city to come up with an aggressive, a moderate, and an incremental strategy towards achieving net zero, um, net zero carbon. And we're sort of, uh, and this is all still uh, in um, work in progress, but you know, we're, we're sort of looking somewhere towards these goals here um, for 100% renewable by 2025 as aggressive and uh, down to incremental 80% 80, 80 renewable by 2030. So, so we've got a lot of ideas. They're all coming together. We're talking to a lot of people. And our focus is on uh, at actionable steps. Not pie in the sky ideas, but things we can do uh, the, uh, from, from day one here. So this is my final uh, graph, but this is sort of gives you an idea of the order of magnitude of, of what we're looking at. So, so here's where we're at uh, today, you know, 2017. So this is a carbon, carbon against time. So here's how much carbon emissions the this, this city is using. And then if we don't do anything, here's, we, we do have uh, an increase in carbon usage because the city is expanding. Um, and uh, if we don't do anything, yes, we will use more carbon. But here's the things that we can do to offset that carbon, uh, that carbon usage. And, and this sort of shows the magnitude of each of those, each of those actionable items. Uh, from retrofits, retro commissioning, off-site renewables, behind the meter solar, um, and uh, phase one and phase two, Retili utility renewables, that's where the utility, uh, we work together in developing like a wind farm or, or a, a, solar, um, a solar farm or, or something like that in the area. And then you can see what the biggest one is, renewable energy credits, uh, RECs they call them. There are some cities in the, in the US already who have declared themselves as net zero uh, carbon, and uh, what they have done is they, they really haven't done any of this. They went straight to RECs and just paid for the RECs and to say uh, we're, we're net zero carbon. But that's not, that's not what the city of Madison has told us to do. They, they said we absolutely want to look at RECs as one of the last things. We want to explore every other option before we go to Rex, but we realize that Rex will will have to be part of our uh, part of the solution. So, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. And we have time for just a few questions. I see Kelly's uh, flag her down if you have one written, and she'll bring them up. Okay. <laughs>
So the first question, is it possible to build a combination solar wind farm? And I would say yes, but I'll <laughs> engineer in the room. It, technically, yes, it's definitely possible, but uh, we don't have too many areas in Wisconsin where, where wind uh, power is actually uh, feasible. Uh, we, have a, we have a little slew towards uh, Iowa County, uh, west of Madison towards Iowa, but, um, but what makes the most sense is, is solar. And you know what's really interesting is that Germany uh, produces about 80% of their electricity from, from solar, and they are further north than us. So, you know, there's no real excuse. We are, we should be producing more solar. Right, and people look askance at the uh, greatest offshore, or greatest wind potential that we have in Wisconsin, which is, is offshore, in either Superior or Michigan. Uh, a lot of shipping lanes, um, and frankly, there's some petroleum running through those lakes, which we need to watch out for as well. Um, okay, so we have another question. This person says, great efforts for municipals, but what percent of total carbon emission do cities contribute? And then how do we address other sources, manufacturing or automobile emissions? So I think this person is saying, okay, if you're just looking at one city, then, you know, what about rural areas and what about manufacturing? I think we sort of talk, we've, we've spoken about fleets in general, but then there's the larger transportation sector, which we shouldn't forget. I, uh, Maria Redmond, the director of my office, said yesterday, 38% of all energy is expended in the transportation sector. So it's really something to think about. Um, but so in Eau Claire, how are you addressing manufacturing? Um, and uh, do you know the percent of the city versus the rest? Yeah, we have not looked at Eau Claire County, for example, the rural area. Um, but I think in the rural parts, you know, that's where like national legislation can take care of like fuel economy standards and things like that. So in the absence of some of that or rollbacks on some of those standards, it's a little bit harder. I think counties or towns would have to step up and, and deal with that themselves on a more localized level uh, to look at those. And then for manufacturing, you know, they're, I know with Excel Energy, they, they have really uh, ramped up a new program for more medium, small, medium businesses to try to help them to take advantages of uh, focus on energy grants where that, set, that, that niche of those type manufacturer businesses weren't really having the um, capabilities to get those types of rebates. So they've retooled some of their efforts to make sure that they're helping those type businesses uh, and that directly benefits you know, a community like Eau Claire. Yeah, that's great, and I think we heard from Dane County yesterday in our resiliency seminar, which this is all sort of about resiliency and sustainability, um, that their climate action plan is, is really working to bridge that urban-rural divide, because that's, it's all part of the same piece of the pie, and I, and I think that um, we'll be watching what Dane County's doing and, and looking at, at how that affects the rest of the state. But I, Ned said it, partnership, partner, partner. We can't do it alone. And, and um, big hats off to Excel for being the only utility in the state who really provides these comprehensive reports. It's so important. We have to know what we're using. We have to be able to measure it since we weren't able to pass that mandatory benchmarking uh, ordinance in Madison. But we're still getting folks to voluntarily benchmark, and we'll, and we'll continue to push that. Um, where we can, we'll just try to explain why it makes so much sense. All right. We'll let you get to the break. Thank you so much. And thanks to our speakers.